The General Insurance is partnering with Black Entrepreneurs Day, an annual event curated by businessman and investor Damon John to celebrate black business. The event will feature conversations with game-changing entrepreneurs, special musical guests, and an NAACP grant sponsored by the General Insurance awarded to an up-and-coming black entrepreneur. Black Entrepreneurs Day will stream live from the world-famous Apollo Theater in New York on October 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. See BlackEntrepreneursDay.com for more. So we are speaking on Tuesday morning, and it sounds like you have a new prime minister. Rishi Sunak. Felix Salmon reports for Axios. <laughs> yeah, how's it feel? Probably the best prime minister we've had in a very long time, which isn't saying very much. The bar is incredibly low. I called up Felix to be my guide to this very strange moment in the UK. Rishi Sunak is the third prime minister just this year. The last prime minister, Liz Truss, resigned after just a few weeks. Her decision to slash taxes caused financial markets to tank. That's when she lost the support of her party. As an American, I can't help but focus on the absurdity of how Rishi Sunak was appointed. Like, after Liz Truss announced her resignation, Sunak was simply, like, agreed upon by the conservative party, right? Correct. This was, this was basically a coronation. There was, I mean, I mean it was a quasi-election. Well, an election among, like, a few people. <laughs> An election among 349 people who are the members of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, or all, all of the Conservative members of Parliament, they they basically got together and reached consensus that it should be Rishi. And then Rishi went to Buckingham Palace and he went through this ceremony called Kissing Hands with the King. Like it just Yeah. I mean it's it's so it's so anachronistic and so dumb. Yeah. This is not what the people in England want necessarily. But it's what they've got. Oh, if there was a general election tomorrow, like the, the conservatives would end up with 10 seats. It would be it would be a complete annihilation. So my main question for Felix was, how did the UK get here? The last four leaders have all been from the conservative Tory party and they've all resigned or been kicked out of office. Exactly how is this still happening? I heard one member of the Labour Party Put it like this. I mean, and gr granted, they have a stake in this. They want a general election because they just see blood in the water right now. But the way that this lawmaker put it was that Rishi Sunak is covered in the mess of the last 12 years, which I don't know if that's true. But if, if you had to explain what that mess is exactly, what would you say? Uh, oh, I can I can explain that mess with one word, which is just Brexit. And Rishi Sunak is covered in the mess of Brexit almost more than anyone else. I mean, if you look at that list of prime ministers, if you look at David Cameron, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, Liz Truss, none of them were diehard Brexiteers. None of them were always on that wing of the Conservative Party that, like, really wanted to leave the EU. The only one who was was Rishi Sunak. So he is deep in the, the deep cause of everything that is wrong with Britain and everything that is wrong with the Conservative Party. He's on, like, the wrong side of that. It's so interesting because you also say he's, like, the best prime minister in <laughs> a decade. The, the least worst. <laughs> Today on the show, why the mess in Britain seems to keep getting more intractable, and why so many, including Felix, say Brexit's to blame. I'm Mary Harris. You're listening to What Next. Stick around. What Next is brought to you by Progressive. What is one thing you'd purchase with just a little extra savings? A weighted blanket, a smart speaker, that new self-care trend you keep hearing about. While well, Progressive 
wants to make sure you are getting what you want by helping you save money on car insurance. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. Discounts like having multiple vehicles on your policy. Progressive offers outstanding coverage and award-winning claim service. Day or night, they have customer support 24-7, 365 days a year. When you need them most, they are at their best. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor. What happens to a country under maximum stress? Just look at America's home front at the dawn of World War II. When you look at a society that's fighting for its survival, I think you really see the best and the worst come to the top. I'm Josh Levine. In the fourth season of Slate's podcast, One Year, we're going back to 1942, telling stories from the distant past that sound like they've been pulled from the present day. You'll hear about runaway inflation and the man who was desperate to stop it. Maybe all Americans will be a little bit colder this winter, but as a result, it's going to be hotter for Hitler. About how the country dealt with massive loads of disinformation. You have the people who are just like, look, the government's making all this up. And about a worker revolt that changed music forever. We're going to put a ban on recordings. We're not doing this anymore. One year, 1942, coming on October 20th. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Naming Brexit as the cause of the current crisis in leadership in the UK is slightly flip. Brexit's obviously made it harder for England to recover from the pandemic and the inflation that's dogged the global economy over the last year. But Felix Salmon blames Brexit for the UK's current situation, mostly because it shifted the vibes for conservative politicians. A little bit at first, and then a whole lot. It meant that anyone who wanted to get elected to be a member of parliament for the Conservative Party had to pretend to believe that Brexit would be good for the country, even though it patently wasn't and could never be. It was going to massively decrease the kind of immigration that every country needs. It was going to massively decrease trade. It was going to massively decrease GDP. It was going to increase inflation. It was always going to do all of these things. And the conservative MPs cannot ever admit that because it is now an article of faith for them that Brexit was a great thing and it's going to turn Britain into some wonderful country. You said Brexit turned the Tory party into a faith-based institution, which I thought was just a really great way to put it. Yeah. And so now, even if you are an urbane technocrat like Rishi Sunak, you have to still hold the tenets of that faith close to your heart and have it at the center of your government policy. And that just creates a deep internal incoherence. You have to believe three impossible things before breakfast just to think that Brexit is workable. It's not workable. Even today, it's not workable. The, you know, you can't get the imports you need. You can't get the food you need. You can't get the labor you need. You can't get the trade you need. Like Nothing is working in Britain. And a huge proportion of why nothing is working is because of Brexit. Brexit was complicated from the very beginning. Remember, back in 2016, then-Prime Minister David Cameron, who was not in favor of leaving the EU, called a referendum on Brexit. He basically assumed the voters would set their leaders straight. So David Cameron was the leader of the Tory party, and the Tory party back then was roughly evenly split between proud Europeans versus, for lack of a better word, anti-Europeans some of whom were so extreme that they actually wanted to leave the EU entirely. And that split within the Tory party made the Tory party almost ungovernable. And so 
what David Cameron decided to do was call a referendum and basically say, listen, I'm just going to answer this question once and for all. We're going to have a referendum. We're going to vote to stay in the EU. And then everyone who's been talking about leaving the EU is just going to have to shut up because we had this referendum and we're staying in. Well, it sounds kind of logical when you think about it. Like, OK, let's let the people decide. Well, yes. Yeah, but the problem is that the people made the wrong decision. The official results are in. The people of Britain have spoken, voting for a British exit, dubbed Brexit, with almost 52 percent. And it was never a binding referendum, but Cameron and the Tory party took it as a binding referendum. I mean, it sounds like the referendum kind of called the Brexiteers bluff. Yeah, exactly. It called, it called them bluff. You, they were like, you really want to leave? OK, great. We're going to leave. Then see how you like it. And now the inevitable and entirely foreseen consequences are happening. David Cameron ended up resigning in the fallout of the referendum vote. Theresa May then took over. But she too resigned in 2019 after failing to follow through on Brexit. So British voters elected Boris Johnson. Energize the country. We're going to get Brexit done on October the 31st. We're going to take advantage of all the opportunities that it will bring in a new spirit of can do. And we are once again. Going- he campaigned on like get Brexit done, which is just like let's do it. But it doesn't talk a lot about what Brexit actually will mean in practice. Well, I remember Theresa May's slogan, which was even more banal, which was Brexit means Brexit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Teresa. That's that's really helpful. <laughs> so remember that Boris Johnson is uh, a very sort of cynical opportunist who the day before he um, announced that he was going to campaign for leave, he wrote two columns for the Telegraph, one saying, I'm going to campaign for leave, and the other one saying, I'm going to campaign for remain. And he basically tossed a coin and decided that he was going to become pro Brexit rather than anti-Brexit, just on the grounds that that way he would be more likely to become prime minister. And yeah, it worked. You know, like he's not going to be remembered as a good prime minister, but he is going to be remembered. And Boris Johnson left an indelible mark on the Conservative Party because getting Brexit done meant eliminating anyone who disagreed with him. There was this big purge, right? Boris Johnson had a terrible time when he had a very small majority that he inherited from Theresa May. He had a very difficult time getting legislation through Parliament because a bunch of his Tory backbenchers who were Remainers kept on asking very sensible questions about how is this going to work and no, we can't vote for this. And eventually what he did is he basically expelled them all from the Conservative Party, called a new election, got a massive majority of hardcore Johnsonite Brexiteers, and then went off to the races. And That actually worked in terms of delivering Brexit, but that wasn't a good thing. So Boris Johnson was, of course, replaced by Liz Truss. And I've heard that Truss's approach to leading the UK, especially during this current financial crisis, it had all the hallmarks of Brexit thinking. Yeah, it, it's basically magical thinking, right? And again, we can we there's lots of echoes of Trump in there. Um, the Brexit is the underpants gnome theory of the economy. So what is that? You you know the the, the famous underpants gnomes from um from South Park, where they are where they're like step one collect underpants, step two question mark, step three profit. Phase one we collect underpants. Yeah yeah yeah, but what about phase two? Well, phase three is profit. Get it? I don't get it. You know, <laughs> and um and. This is basically the, the theory of Brexit, which is step one, leave the EU. Step two, question mark. Step three, glorious sunlit uplands. And this was exactly the same as Liz Truss's economic policy, which is step one, cut taxes on the rich. Step two, question mark. Step three, everything becomes great again. And it's entirely faith-based. There's no coherent sort of stitched together economic model that would support it. What Liz Truss proposed was a kind of modified Reaganomics, giving unfunded tax cuts to spur economic growth. But most economists thought this kind of spending was going to make inflation worse. And the markets responded. And so what she wound up causing was a massive implosion in the bond market because everyone's like, you're going to have to borrow how much money? You're borrowing a lot already and you're going to have to borrow even more because 
you're increasing the deficit so much because of these tax cuts. And it just arithmetically didn't add up. But, we, you know, as far as trust was concerned, we were in this kind of post arithmetic world where all you need is hope and conviction. And she had that and then she resigned. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. I was struck by how Liz Truss herself talked about her exit from leadership. Like, she seemed a little wistful when she spoke, almost saying, like, I wish we could have Brexited more. And we set out a vision for a low-tax, high-growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise, though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. Like, when she says something like that, what do you make of it? She she was surprisingly unapologetic. There was one brief moment where she, she kind of apologised for the, for the mini-budget that caused all of the chaos and said, oh, whoops, we made a mistake. But no, she, she came out with her final speech and basically said, I was right. And, you know, the markets were wrong and we can't let the markets dictate what's happening in the country. And if you just, you know, as I say, like, to be a Tory is to believe impossible things. And she genuinely believes that if she'd been able to enact those economic policies, that that would have been awesomely wonderful for Britain. After the break. It is only right to explain why I'm standing here as your new prime minister. What does all this mean for Rishi Sunak, the UK's new prime minister? Hi, it's David Plotz, co-host of Slate's Political Gab Fest podcast. And I am very excited to announce that we're doing a live show in Atlanta on Wednesday, November 2nd. Please join me and Emily Bazelon and John Dickerson at Georgia Tech's first Center for the Arts for a great night of political discussion, debate, and fun. Slate Plus members get an exclusive discount. So if you're not a Slate Plus member yet, this is a great time to join. Go to slate.com slash GabFest Live right now to get your tickets. They're first come, first served. Again, that's slate.com slash GabFest Live for more information and to buy your tickets for our November 2nd live show in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. We'll be streaming it too. So if you can't make it in person that night, fear not, you can join our virtual gathering instead. Slate.com slash GabFest Live. Hey, everybody, it's Lizzie O'Leary. For What Next TBD, we would love to hear about your experience with Twitter. Do you love it? Hate it? Just tell us a story about what it means to you. And does Elon Musk's potential purchase change anything for you? Give us a call at 202-681-7167 and leave us a voicemail for the chance to have your voice in the show. Don't forget to leave us your name. 202-681-7167. Thanks a lot. Earlier this week, the UK's brand new prime minister gave his first press conference from that iconic podium in front of 10 Downing Street. Right now, our country is facing a profound economic crisis. The aftermath of COVID still lingers. Putin's war in Ukraine has destabilized energy. He sounded earnest enough, but my question for Felix Salmon was what exactly can Rishi Sunak do here? So right now the Tory party is in that Wiley Coyote moment where it's already run off the top of the cliff, but it hasn't fallen. They have this large majority in parliament for another couple of years before they need to call an election. So they get to rule the country even though there's very little popular support for them. And if there was a general election tomorrow, they would lose most of their seats. So to lead the Tory party is to lead a party that basically is staring death and disaster in the face. It knows that at the next election, it's going to get wiped out, there's going to be like this huge swing from Conservative to Labour. And 
they're just sort of trying to work out what can we do over the next two years to try and minimize the damage of that election. And frankly, the answer is not very much. The damage has been done. Is there really no way that Rishi Sunak could reckon with Brexit? I mean, I suppose he could come out and say, whoops, this was a terrible idea and it's made everything worse and we should try and roll back some of it and start re-entering the EU and be much more constructive and start signing on to some of their basic trade agreement stuff. But no, there's no way he could do that. He, he would face an immediate revolt in the Tory party. He would last five seconds. There's a certain, I don't know if I'd call it poetry, but there's a, like a you break it, you bought it kind of <laughs> element to this. Exactly. The Tories broke it. The Tories bought it. The Tories are going to wind up imploding and uh, as, as a result of this fateful decision that David Cameron made to call that referendum. It's a very deserved end to a pretty shambolic party. But the sad thing is that it's not just the Tories who've been devastated. It's the whole country. You know, I think as an American... There's a temptation to look at the UK and basically say, like, wow, crazy things are happening over there. But I wonder if you think there are lessons in what's going on in the UK for the rest of us, and if so, what those lessons are. I, I, I feel that far too many people have been very quick to draw sort of fiscal lessons, and they're like, you know, especially on the right, I'm hearing a lot of commentary saying, like, well, the lesson of Britain is that we need more fiscal responsibility. Like, no, the lesson of Britain is that you can't have a faith-based government which just starts with an ideology rather than with reality. And I do worry that there are an increasing number of ideologues running for elected office in the United States. And, you know, if the big lie in Britain is, you know, Brexit is going to be good for the country... And that was a lie that is very attractive to a certain amount of the populace that they wound up voting for. Then the equivalent lie in the United States is Donald Trump won the 2020 election. And now a huge number of people are desperate to vote for anyone who will parrot that lie with a straight face. Yeah. I'm glad you talked about the fiscal lessons and how they tie in here. Because I agree with you when I looked at what happened before Liz Truss resigned with the the tanking pound. You know, I think there were a lot of people who were saying, well, could this happen here? Could this happen in the United States? Like, what? what's the lesson here? And the more I read about it, the more I thought that the lesson was metaphorical versus like one-to-one, -one, because there are lots of reasons why what happened in the UK won't happen in the United States, I, you know, from how our mortgage markets work to how our dollar is like the reserve currency for the world. It's just different. But it's also what happened shows how fragile we are, just generally, like post-pandemic, and how unexpected and unexpectedly bad things can happen in this fragile period, I guess. And, and more broadly, I think Brexit shows how when you have a deeply divided country where there's just two halves of the country that don't speak the same language and just are completely irreconcilable, that's a recipe in any democracy for disaster at the government level. Don't vote for things that don't make sense. Don't vote for what you want to be true rather than what is true. Don't vote for, you know, faith-based policies. Don't vote for politicians who promise things that are unrealistic because they will wind up delivering chaos. Felix Salmon, I'm super grateful for your time. Thanks for joining the show. I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't be happier. Next time I'll be happier. Felix Salmon is the chief financial correspondent over at Axios. He also hosts the great Slate Money podcast. And that's the show. 
if you are a fan of what we're doing here at What Next, the best way to support our work is to join Slate Plus. So head on over to slate.com slash whatnextplus and sign up, like right now. What Next is produced by Elena Schwartz, Mary Wilson, Carmel Delshad, and Madeline Ducharme. We are getting a ton of support right now from Anna Phillips and Jared Downing. We are led by Alicia Montgomery and Joanne Levine. And I'm Mary Harris. I will be back in this feed bright and early tomorrow. Catch you then.